most people have kind of two gears, two ways of improvising over the rhythm changes A sections. First gear is like a key of B flat, uh, really bluesy sounds, playing kind of in the key, but not really outlining every single chord change. And gear number two is like the bebop approach, playing the changes, really outlining every single chord, altering the dominant chords, arpeggiating minor chords, and so forth. The clip I chose for the beginning of this video was Michael Brecker playing two A sections. This is the clip that I used for one of the previous lessons where I used it for the bridge. And this is the last A right after that bridge and then the first A at the top of the form. His first chorus that I played in that intro is gear number one. He's just playing like in the key bluesy sounds. And then right at the top of the form, he switches to gear number two and he starts really playing the changes in a bebop way. This video is going to be about the second gear. The first gear is a little more straightforward and easy to figure out on your own if you can play some bluesy licks um, and then you can phrase it in the right way for rhythm changes, which check my previous video to get my thoughts on phrasing. You can figure that out. Um, I might do another video on it at some point, but this video we're going to dive right into playing the changes um, and getting some bebop sounds happening over this A section. So before we get into the harmonic stuff and the scale choices, I just want to give you guys an outline of how I have actually gotten myself so I can play over this tune at a quick tempo. I've had a lot of students come to me and say, I really want to play over these chord changes, but I just can't think fast enough. I can't pull out every chord shape and by the time I can think of it, it's gone and I'm on the next chord and it's a total mess. And I used to be the exact same way. It's very difficult to get this chord progression happening because it goes by so fast. And the way I personally got through it and the way pretty much everyone else I've ever talked to who can play it got through it, did it was we just worked out examples and practiced them. So when I was learning this, I would work out an example of one A section playing a really a line that I liked. I would just take the time to compose it. And then I would practice the crap out of it hours and hours and hours until it was under my fingers and I could do it without even thinking. And then I did another one, another one, another one. And after about 10 or so, I started kind of combining them and forgetting which one was which. And I just had all these little fragments that worked over the different sections that I could pull out and that kind of came naturally. And, you know, before I knew it, I was basically improvising, combining all of my little, you know, mini licks and lines to create new solos over rhythm changes. So I just wanted to say that before we get into the actual mechanics of working out lines, that you won't be able to play over this thing until you put in those hours and hours and hours of practicing these examples that I'm going to show you how to write. So let's get into it. Now, I'm willing to admit there is a lot of stuff you can play over these chord changes. So what I'm going to try to do now is just give you guys some easy, straightforward, you know, quick to implement ideas that you can use. I'm not going to give you tons of stuff. I'm just going to give you like one idea per each chord or section or so. So let's just start at the beginning. And I have these chords annotated on the screen now because I figured out how to do that. And it's awesome. So check it out. You have B flat, G7, C minor, F7. What I'm playing over the B flat is B flat major seven arpeggio, nothing too fancy. And for the purpose of making this easier to play, this, this chord progression, I've learned it in this position, like this G minor looking position on the third fret. Uh, so it looks like this. I know it's not the most straightforward place to play B flat major seven, but since I really like playing G7 here, where it's in root position, I learned my previous chord there just 
to make it flow easier as I'm learning it. Okay, so that's my first chord. For my second chord, what I'm going to use is A flat diminished arpeggio, which has A flat, B, D, F, and we're back to A flat. The reason I'm using this is because if you look at the notes, all it is is a G7 flat 9. I'm not going to go into depth in that. I will in another video, but I can't really afford the time because I don't want this video to be like half an hour long if I explain every chord in such detail. But what I do want to say about this G7 is that it is very, very important to outline this chord if you want to sound like you're playing bebop. The reason being that this chord is not in the key of B flat because it has a B natural, the third of the chord. And that note, for that reason, that it's because it's not in the key, but it's in that chord, it's extremely important. And most of the time when I'm just running through these changes, on beat one of that chord, I'm landing on B natural. Uh, so I'll give you guys an example of me playing B flat major 7 arpeggio and then landing on B natural and playing diminished A flat diminished arpeggio so check it out I might play okay one more I'll give you one more let's see so just straightforward running through each arpeggio okay on to the next two measures C minor to F7 this is a 2-5 right in the key. I'm probably not going to alter this F7 or anything. I'm just going to play it root 3rd, 5th, 7th. If you don't know any 2-5 vocabulary, now is the time that you need to go learn it because that's kind of a prerequisite to being able to play over this form. I just have lots and lots of 2-5 licks that I've learned that I can just pull out in situations like this, and I think that's like totally necessary. Uh, so if you don't have any, there's no shame in turning off this video for, you know, a couple days and learning a bunch and then coming back when you have them together. Um, you know, they sound like... Or maybe... You know, I just have tons of them I can pull out um, on command. So now I'll play something using everything I've talked about for the first two measures. And I'm all over the thirds of all these chords, especially um, the G7, like I talked about, the C minor 7, and the F7, and especially the F7, um, because, um, I don't know, dominant chords, it just seems like the third is always the really great note to land on. Okay, on to the next two measures. D minor 7, G7, C minor 7, F7. The way I treat D minor 7 and G7 is slightly different than the way I'm treating the C minor to F. The reason being that, like I talked about, G7 earlier is not in the key. It's what's called a secondary dominant. And again, I'm going to be playing that a flat diminished arpeggio, the G7 flat 9 arpeggio over that. So I'm still in the same position, and I usually just arpeggiate the D minor chord and then play that diminished. So I might play or you can switch it around. And then again, I'm going to pull out some C minor, F7, 2-5 vocabulary that I have ready to go for those last two measures. And my D minor, starting on D minor, I might play something like... Or one more example. Okay, now I'll play the first four measures with everything I've talked about. Um, okay, now let's jump to the next two measures, F minor, B flat, E flat, 
and then a flat seven. The two five to e flat since the b flat is another secondary dominant i'm going to treat it just like i treated the g and a nice little trick is to take that fingering of a flat diminished and just slide it right up to b diminished and that will outline a b flat seven flat nine sound so where i was playing a flat diminished here <laughs> Now I'm playing same fingering. Oh, sorry. Ah, oh, that was awful. There it is. And then for the F minor seven, the stuff I was playing over B, you can just take that from where you were playing here and move up the exact same fingerings, a minor third to F, and then you don't have to practice any new vocabulary because you already have it, which I always would encourage using your practice more effectively, or efficiently, I should say, where you can learn a fingering and then use it in two places. And you can even play the exact same lick over the F minor B flat as you did over the D minor into G7. So let me play the form this far, and then I'll talk about that A flat seven chord. Okay, and now I stopped conveniently right before my A flat seven. Now, this is not a secondary dominant. It doesn't resolve back into the key by, you know, uh, going down a fifth. It is actually what's called a static dominant chord, meaning that it just exists on its own and it's beautiful and it's there for a second and it doesn't, it's not functional. It's just, you know, a nice sound and then you're on to the D minor um, in the measure after that. So the appropriate scale choice for this is Lydian dominant. Static dominant chords, always you play Lydian dominant over them. And that might sound like a big headache, but I'll break it down into something a little more simple. So Lydian dominant is mode four of melodic minor. And if it's mode four of melodic minor, then A flat Lydian dominant is in the key of E flat melodic minor. So what does that mean? That means that where the chord before it, I have an E flat major. Now I have E flat melodic minor. And the only difference between major and melodic minor is a minor third. So I just take what I was playing over the E flat major seven and I put a flat third in. So I change the G to G flat. And that's all I have to do for that chord. And I'm always outlining that actual change. So I'll just play starting on the F minor to show you. Okay. And sometimes I'll just sit on that note because that note sounds great there. And then you're into the last two measures, which are like the... Um, which are just like a previous two measures where you have D minor, G, C, F. So I'm not going to talk about those again because it's basically the same thing, except that you can use the diminished arpeggio over that last F because that F resolves down a fifth to B flat at the top of the form. So you can use G flat diminished arpeggio over that. So now I will play an idea over everything I just talked about. Thank you. 